make these accusations, but what do you want me to do? Under my rule, the people know protection and peace. Without me, they would truly drown in blood. His name? Oliver Cromwell. He was a gentleman farmer who fought for Parliament in the Civil War, who rose to the rank of Commander-in-Chief of the Army, who signed the death warrant of King Charles I, who ruled England, Scotland, and Ireland alone from 1653 to 1658. But what sort of man was he? When Cromwell died, they wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a coffin lined with lead. Yet his foul stench still broke free. And truly his name and memory stinks even greater than did his corpse. People look back on the days of Oliver Cromwell and praise him so what brave things he did, and oh, how all the neighbouring princes did fear him. At first, how glorious. He destroyed all the enemies of Parliament. But then, such betrayal. His ambition overtook him, he crushed us underfoot, and all that would oppose him he had removed. The days of Oliver Cromwell were marvellous days of prosperity, liberty, peace. Confused? Cromwell provoked strong feelings of love, of hatred, and these different judgments, different interpretations didn't stop on his death. He's kept historians arguing ever since. Discovering the truth may not be possible. So, first, Cromwell the Army General. It is 1645. Two English armies face each other. One for the king, the other for parliament. The final battle of the first civil war is about to be fought. The enemy was drawn up, ready to give us battle at Naseby. We would have been cut off before we were drawn into battle formation. But Lieutenant General Cromwell drew us up into a body, ready to face the enemy. We marched yesterday after the king. After three hours very doubtful fight, we at last routed his army. Sir, this is none other but the hand of God on our side, and to him alone belongs the glory. Naseby was a great victory for Parliament. 500 royalists dead, 5,000 prisoners taken, 100,000 pounds of plunder recovered. And though Cromwell wasn't yet commander-in-chief, few would deny him his moment of glory. Cromwell and I, we go way back. I was with him in the Fens when he raised his first troop. But I've never seen his genius so sharp as it was today. I'd say he won the battle, and belike he'll win us this war. You see, the skill's not in the charge. Any Tom Fool can charge. The skill's in controlling the charge, turning the cavalry with you, rounding back into the fight. And on a day like today, with the mud thick, that's something. I'm proud to serve such a man. What was Cromwell out to achieve? That's always the question to ask, and at this point, it's not difficult to answer. He wanted Parliament to win the war, quickly, efficiently. If that meant creating a new type of army, so be it. Cromwell makes officers of those that were but lately merely human. It's as if he wants the nation's beggars to rise in mighty numbers and set up for themselves to the utter ruin of all the nobility and gentry. He won't touch men of rank in his troop. He'll only recruit common men, poor, of mean parentage. Well, why not? If a tinker or an apprentice has backbone and wit enough, I'd rather follow him than some gentleman picked for his title. You should see the royalist leaders. Their noses stuck in Julius Caesar like you can learn war from a book. Or they think, it's all right. I've hunted foxes. I'll get by. tell you. Well, some of our own generals are as bad. You need professionals. Ability, not nobility. And Cromwell alone understands that. Cromwell had created a new model army. A force of soldiers, disciplined and efficient, regardless of their backgrounds. 
It won Pollum at the war. But his success had made him many enemies. Oh, that nonsense surrounding this jumped-up farmer Cromwell. They say he promotes on experience. Funny how his son-in-law is doing so well. They say his military genius is unrivaled. Rubbish. He just has more men. Seven years ago, Cromwell was gathering dust on the back benches of Parliament. Now he struts around the country with a drunken, victorious army on his tail. And they say he would bring his majesty to trial. Can you imagine? Cromwell is not fit to lick the king's bootstraps. The year is 1649. King Charles has been brought to trial. He refuses to recognize the court's authority, but nevertheless, the verdict is guilty. Charles Stuart, King of England, trusted to rule according to the rules of this land, had a wicked plan to rule as he wanted. Like a traitor, he waged war against Parliament and people. So he is responsible for all the murders, burnings, damage and destruction caused during the war. He is a tyrant, traitor, murderer and an enemy of the people of England. The King's fate lay in the hands of the Army Council, of which Cromwell was a leading member. It took them a week to reach a decision. We didn't begin this war because we wished the King dead, but to free him from his evil counsellors. But the king betrayed our trust. Cromwell wanted a settlement, but Charles Stuart went to Scotland. He began a second bloody war. He has the guts of England on his hands, and he's lost the right to be called king. And though it burns his conscience, Cromwell and his colleagues on the army council must deliver us from this evil. On January 30th, 1649, King Charles I was beheaded outside his palace at Whitehall. Oh, truly, there is a space in hell reserved for Cromwell now. To kill his king, to kill God's chosen one. Oh, the shame. And the trial was a farce. They had no authority, except the authority that comes from cannon and shot. For the army stood by at Cromwell's whim. Oh, yes, the king died because no one dared stand up to Mr. Tyrant Cromwell. Oh, truly, what is to become of England now? It all depended on Cromwell's intentions. He'd killed the king, but what did he hope to achieve? It's getting harder to answer. Troll his writings, his speeches, any clues lurking there? Truly, I'm not wedded or glued to any particular form of government. We need a settlement, certainly, something that'll work, perhaps with something of a monarch in it. You see, the king's head was not taken off because he was king but because he'd betrayed his trust. Whatever happens, we must avoid division. Cromwell appeared confused. Politics seemed a great deal more complicated than winning battles. Others, however, had quite clear ideas. They saw the death of the king and hoped for a shake-up in society. And Cromwell, they felt, was the man who would make it happen. Oh, Cromwell, where art thou going? You wear the victor's laurels, the army is yours. Snap your fingers, it'll happen. Everything we ever wanted, rights, freedoms, the well-being of every man, every woman, every child. You think we're dreaming? No! For does not the Bible say, overturn, 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 and it will happen. A vote for every man, a parliament that answers to no lord or king, but to the people, yes! Listen to our demands and do not let us down. Cromwell's response was unexpected and unforgiving. I tell you, sir, you have no other way to deal with these men but to break them. Or they will break you and bring all the blood and treasure spent in this kingdom upon your heads and shoulders. You must break them. On the 13th of May, 1649, Four levellers were executed outside Burford Church on Cromwell's command. Oh, Cromwell, where art thou going? These were your men. On the field of Naseby, they put their trust in God for you. They kept their powder dry for you. Without them, you would have been nothing. But you have no ears for the common man. Their pleas you answer with the firing squad. We have been badly used. 
Cromwell wasn't a revolutionary. His upbringing was comfortable. He owned property, and like most people at the time, saw property as the qualification for power. He spelled out his position clearly. A nobleman, a gentleman, a yeoman. These distinctions are good for the country. It wouldn't be right to make all equal, to make the tenant as rich as the landlord. These ideas encourage only those of the criminal classes. Is this a contradiction? That a man who has killed a king still puts such faith in rank, order, position? Maybe. Does the next stage in the story reveal his intentions more clearly? It's 1653. Four years have passed since the king's death. England has yet to find a settlement that keeps the peace. Cromwell is in supreme control of the army. Lord General Cromwell came to the house and began pacing the floor and said, You are no parliament. I will end your sitting. Then he called in twenty or thirty musketeers. Then Cromwell, pointing to the speaker, said, Fetch him down. He went to the table where the mace lay and said, Take away these baubles. The soldiers took away the mace. The house went out. You know what they say, truth will out. I've always said Cromwell was just a bully, and now he's proved it. No, he hasn't. All he's proved is desperate times need desperate measures. Cromwell is no dictator. He consults his council, but his parliaments let him down. He hoped for people who felt as he did, but instead he got weaklings and fools. I hear you got promotion. It'll be my privilege to supervise the western counties. You ignorant, pompous fool. You soldiers are despised, and now Cromwell will have you rule the nation. And he is to be Lord Protector. Oh, Lord, protect us from such vanity. Cromwell was hated by the royalists and hated by the revolutionaries on Parliament's side. Could he win over the people in the middle? The trouble was that the only person with the right to rule was Charles Stuart, the son of the dead king. Cromwell had no right, only the power through military strength to do what he wanted. For two years he tried to find a parliament he could work with, but in 1655 fell back on the army. Right. I have my orders to collect taxes, to ban unlawful assemblies, to close theatres, pubs, race meetings, gambling dens, to cancel Christmas, to find those who swear or curse twelvepence, and place drunkards in the stocks. Hmm. I think Cromwell's orders will be carried through. Oh, the joy of a sharpened pike. The rule of the major generals brought law and order, but Cromwell still looked for a more legal base to his power. England had always been a monarchy. Perhaps he should be king. It might win over the people in the middle and make him less dependent on the army. I am commanded by the Parliament of England, Scotland and Ireland to present this humble petition and advice unto your highness. They desire to give the head of government a new name, which is of king, and hope that your highness will take that name, which is better known and more suitable than that of a protector. Many felt England would be more stable if he became king. Others were scornful. A king is God's appointed, and Cromwell will never be that. Instead, he mimics kingship. Westminster Palace he has made his home. Hampton Court for the weekends. Butlers and underbutlers and pages and grooms and gentlemen of the bedchamber and gentlemen of my Lord Protector's pisspot. And when he assumed that title, Lord Protector, oh, the pomp and majesty. He wanted to be a king, all right. Well, did we kill one king to make another? I followed that man from Edge Hill to Dunbar, but not to have him swagger in pompous majesty. And what, will his son inherit in his turn? I would laugh were it not the tears well up in my eyes. I sent him a letter, begged him to consider what he's doing. It's the Parliament that tempts him. No one in the army wants this. Indeed, I've heard the colonels threaten to shoot him in the head if he should take the crown. Cromwell turned the crown down. Why? No one can be sure. Maybe it stuck against his principles. Maybe he knew it would appall many in the army, and without the army, he could not rule. Have we heard all? 
Do any witnesses to Cromwell's character remain unheard? In Anamun spirit nave lanyard, Murish a machling egg trail. There is one more voice. It speaks Gaelic, the tongue of the Irish. Without this voice, no verdict on Cromwell's character is possible. In the name of the Father, full of virtue, and the Son who suffered pain, listen, for in my eyes the story still unfolds. How there was a breach in the wall, and how the bodies of Cromwell's men filled the breach, but still they came, and how Cromwell was white with fighting fury, and called no prisoners, and how his army of saints set to their butchery, and how innocent men and women and children fell before him. It wasn't just soldiers they killed. They nailed a baby to a church door. Excuse me. The Irish Catholics had been in revolt against English Protestants in Ireland since 1641. In 1649, it fell on Cromwell as Lord General to restore order. He made it clear the mission would be welcome. It hath pleased God to bless our endeavour at Drogheda. The enemy made a stout resistance. But God, giving a new courage to our men, they attempted again and entered, beating the enemy from their defences. Our men were ordered by me to put all defendants to the sword, I do not think 30 of the whole number escaped with their lives. When I think back on what we did, the gorge rises in my throat. But there was God in my sword hand, and God smiled all the more with every sinful papist rebel split. One's duty can be terrible, but one's duty can never be ignored. Cromwell felt no need to excuse his actions in Ireland. In his eyes, his victims were Catholic, and so beneath contempt. Cromwell and his men forced us from our homes. It was the middle of winter. The roads were thick with snow. Our lands, you see, were rich, fit for Englishmen, not for native Irish. Not that we weren't given the choice. To hell or Connacht, they said. Either you die or you grub your way out west to eke out a meagre existence in a land so barren you'll die there anyway. There was famine. Hundreds were taken by the good Lord. The year is 1658. Cromwell dies of malaria. Within two years, the royalists had their revenge. Cromwell's embalmed body was dug up and beheaded. But after the revenge of the royalists was over, how has history judged Oliver Cromwell? This man took the throne of three kingdoms without the name of king, but with a greater power and authority than had been claimed by any king. The greatest, because the most typical Englishman of all time. At the end of the 19th century, some of the older women would still threaten naughty children with the name of Oliver Cromwell. If you aren't a good girl, old Oliver will have thee. We can see him as the fiery fighter for freedom, or the clever politician using all his skill to keep a hated army rule going. So, Oliver Cromwell, hero or villain? Boys bare legs and boys bare bottoms. Oh, lovely. Wicked Women. Films to spice up Monday nights starting next Monday on BBC Two. This is BBC Two opening the history file. January 1660. In the streets of London, unpaid soldiers clash with civilians. 
the confusion breeds fear of another civil war and much talk on who should rule the country. My lord told me that he did believe that Charles, the son of Charles I, would return from exile in France to be king. There's still much debate about bringing in someone as protector again, but my lord was sure that he would not last very long. No, nor the king neither, unless he carry himself very soberly and well. Why such confusion on who should rule the country? Since the death of Cromwell in 1658, no one could agree over who should succeed him. With the country in chaos, General Monk, the leader of the army in Scotland, marched south. The powerful landowning gentry in their country houses wondered what his intentions were. I heard it whispered in the galleries, last night the city men feasted General Monk in Vintner's Hall, and a toast was made to the king, and General Monk smiled. Smiled, eh? But that's certain, then. Monk means to bring back the king. Oliver Cromwell will be turning in his grave. Or maybe Monk smiles because he means to take the crown himself. Another thug soldier in control. Uh, someone has to be in control. Whole blooming countries fall into pieces. Better a thug soldier like Monk than Charles Blooming Stuart. French fart, that's what he is. Can you see him towing the parliament line? <laughs> I think not. And mark my words, we bring him back, he'll string us up, every man jack of us. I fought against his father, I did. I, I fought for the good old cause. Toasting the king? It's a mockery. Well, I think it's rather sweet. And I think after all this chaos, it'll be rather nice to curtsy to someone who doesn't rule by the bayonet. Even if that someone does wear a rather silly foreign wig. Such secret royalist longings were fulfilled on the 29th of May, 1660. This day, His Majesty Charles II came to London on his 30th birthday after a sad and long exile. He was greeted by thousands of people, all shouting with inexpressible joy, the streets all strewn with flowers and hung with tapestry, the bells ringing, fountains running with wine. I stood on the strand and beheld it and blessed God. This was a new situation. Kings were meant to be all-powerful, but this king had been invited to rule by Parliament. So who was really in control? At first, Parliament gave Charles every chance. He was given a regular income, could choose his own ministers, control the army. But did he have the character to survive? The silliness of the king is well known, playing with his dog during council meetings and not minding business. I've even heard it said that as the Dutch fleet sailed up the River Medway, he was chasing a moth around the room with one of his mistresses. Mighty fine. Hmm, I thought so. And it goes with the rest of me. He was a prince of many virtues and a great many faults, but he would doubtless have been an excellent prince had he been less addicted to women. In the king's arms, at the corner of Lucna Lane, calling for beer. Beer? <laughs> There's a kiss in the dark for a less. <laughs> Was there more to Charles than this merry monarch? Many said that he hid the deeper side to his character. Charles chose rather to be shut off than troubled, and it was this part of his personality that helped keep the peace, for he was in a very difficult political situation, and a wrong word could have brought about his downfall. He had a softness of temper that charmed all who came near him. He hated business, but when it was necessary, he would stay as long as his ministers had work for him. Charles was determined to use his wit and cunning to survive, this was no easy task. Beneath the surface, the country still bled from years of political and religious conflict. Tell you one thing about this king. Damn sight better than being governed by the mob. Didn't like that at all. Parliament stuffed with tradesmen. Boot boys giving orders. Damned uncomfortable. Smell my perfume as worn by the Queen of Bohemia. You got me old job back to her. Local magistrate. Village idiot booted off the bench and good riddance. There's a marvellous job in covering the smell of pox. 
which, as they say, is rife in the court. It's just like the old days. God, King, Parliament, peasants dot their hats, step out of line, flog them. At the ball last night, a lady-in-waiting gave birth to one of the King's bastards in full view of the company. Good Lord. Charles's dandies, half of them naked, stood around and clapped. Can you imagine? And I hear he sits at the theatre with a woman on each knee. And women, not boys, play all the female roles. It's disgusting. He's just like his father. He's too hoity-toity. He thinks he's a god. He goes up to diseased beggars and touches them, imagining they'll then skip off like lambs. And everything's French. I do hate the French. French food, French silks, French silver. French religion. I beg your pardon. Well, what do you think, brother? His mother's Catholic, his sister's Catholic, his wife's Catholic. He keeps it quiet, but tongues are beginning to wag. Charles did have quiet Catholic leanings, but kept his beliefs to himself. He was naturally tolerant and had promised that people would be allowed to worship as they wished. But Parliament believed in one state church, the Anglican Church, with the king at its head. They brought in heavy penalties for those who refused to join it. For a peaceful nation, the people all have to be of the same religion. So all churches and chapels are to use the 1662 prayer book, and anyone who refuses will have to leave their job. So to survive, Charles knew he had to show loyalty to the Church of England. In return, the Church was prepared to support him. The Church of England glories in nothing more than she is the truest friend of kings and of kingly government of any church in the world. Many Puritans refused to accept the Church of England and died in jail. But it was the Catholics who were to haunt Charles's reign. Oh dear Sir Ralph, I am sorry to be the messenger of so dismal news, for poor London is almost burnt down. It began on Saturday night in Pudding Lane and has burnt ever since. We have packed up all our goods to leave but cannot get a cart at any price. It made me weep to see it. The churches, houses and all on fire. Everybody endeavouring to remove their goods and fling them into the river or bring them into boats. The ground was so hot as almost to scorch my shoes. I saw the cathedral bells melting and the walls tumbling down. Meanwhile, the ignorant mob vented their rage against the Roman Catholics and Frenchmen. A blacksmith in my presence, meeting an innocent Frenchman, knocked him down with an iron bar. Monday morning produced first a suspicion and then a general agreement that this fire was not an accident, rather that it was the result of a conspiracy, the Dutch or French. Shortly after, all the Roman Catholics were blamed as well. The Great Fire of London wasn't caused by any Catholic conspiracy. That people believed it was shows the depth of popular suspicion of Roman Catholics. These fears grew when in 1676 the heir to the throne, Charles's brother James, refused to attend the Church of England's Easter Communion. Rumors began to spread. Have you heard? Is it true? A cellar overflowing with swords and powder. Blooming Catholics, mark my words. And there was talk of poisoning the king. Lord have mercy, we'll all be murdered in our beds. Oh, don't be silly, brother. It's just tittle-tattle. Oh, you would say that, wouldn't you? You would court all day, picking up their fancy ways. What on earth is that on your face? A beauty spot. Spots are beautiful now, are they? It's blooming Catholic. What I want to know is if this monarch like so much. He's so free with the ladies. Why hasn't he got a strapping young son now to carry on the Protestant faith? I hear he's got plenty of sons. Yes, but he didn't have the sense to marry their mothers, did he? No, shame. Shame? Shame? Is that all you can say? Charlie boy pops off. His blooming Catholic brother James takes the crown. That's if his blooming Catholic brother has the decency to wait. I've heard there's Catholic rebellion at boiling point, and these Frenchies are just itching to invade. The rumors were fueled by more anti-Catholics. 